You're going to get more attention if you work just as hard. Hey there, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 266, and today I'm joined by Master Jalen Croft. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best martial arts conversations every Monday, as well as a topic show every Thursday. That's right, twice a week, martial arts goodness for all of you traditional martial arts fans. There's a throwback to the old intro that just kind of rolled out of my head. You know, you say something a few dozen, hundred times, and it just kind of hangs out back there, and once in a while it pops up, and that's kind of what goes on here at the show. That's kind of a good corollary to martial arts training, isn't it? We do things over and over so that they become part of who we are and hopefully help us become better people. If you want to check out the show notes to this episode, to any of the other episodes, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Sign up for the newsletter while we're there. While you're there, we're always there because we are going to send you some great stuff. I haven't mentioned it in a while, but if you're new to the show, if you sign up for the newsletter, you're going to get an exclusive podcast episode that we never aired. I'm not even going to tell you what it is. It's cool. It's awesome. You should do it. If you want to check out our products, those are at whistlekick.com. And don't forget the multitude of other sites that we offer. Martial Journal, Martial Arts Memes, Martial Arts Calendar, and there's more. Best place to find it all is at whistlekick.com. That's our digital hub for our brand, our growing efforts to help the traditional martial artists of the world get whatever they need, whether it's products or connections to other people or events just kind of what we do. Let's talk about today's episode. Our guest today did not have a smooth martial arts journey when she was young. Master Jalen Croft's school closed just before she was about to test for her black belt. Getting into a new system and testing for a black belt there wasn't easy, as anyone who has trained in multiple styles knows all too well. That experience shaped her to become the exceptional martial artist she is today. So let's welcome her to the show. Master Croft, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for being here. And and I got to ask, did you did you get any Tomb Raider jokes in school? <laughs> All the time. All the time. All right. Well, then then I won't say anything more about it. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? Why don't you um, tell the people where, where are you? I don't even know that I, I know am, the answer to that question. I am right outside of Atlanta in Marietta, Georgia, so I'm about 20 minutes north of Atlanta. Okay. You guys are getting some ice right now, aren't you? We are. It's yeah. very uh, odd for us. <laughs> but <laughs> I thought I caught that on the news. So here we are. It, we are having a heat wave in Vermont based on the last couple of weeks. It, it's 25 degrees outside the oh office right now. And, you know, to us, that's no big thing. But, of course... You know, you folks getting freezing down there, that's enough to warrant our news. It is. We actually are out of school today because they thought the roads might freeze over, but nothing happened. So they just got a random day off. Well, that's not too bad. Yeah. Good day to be a kid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. School off for no reason. Yeah. <laughs> of course, this is not the Weather Channel. We're not here to t discuss <laughs> meteorology, unless that happens to be a passion of yours. It is not of mine. No, we're here to talk about the thing that you and I have in common, which is martial arts. And, you know, I'll, I'll tell the listeners that, you know, just as I, I told you before we started recording, I found you just kind of randomly, I believe, on Instagram. And I liked what you were putting out. And this this goes back. This might even go back two years that you were putting out content of substance. You were being really honest about who you are and just kind of portraying your martial arts journey. And since then, I've watched you on social media. I've watched you grow as a person, as a martial artist. And, and I said, you know what? It's time. Yeah, I really appreciate that because I do like to put out content that's um, raw and, and real, you know, like stuff that it's not just, oh, here, I'm, I'm kicking above my head. But like, to be honest, I can't hold a kick above my head. But, you know, <laughs> here is me trying to stretch and trying that and this and that. Like everybody um, isn't you know, perfect at everything and isn't, um, 
it doesn't come with a great picture or, or anything like that. So I want to put out something for the people who, um, you know, aren't, aren't great. Like weren't naturally talented with it, you know, which is the majority of folks. Yeah, definitely. And I think the challenge of social media is that for the most part, what we get is the best of the best of the best, the, the one out of 10,000 photographs that's perfect and the airbrushed abs and the, you know, the high end fashion shoots. And we start to think that this is everyday life because we're surrounding ourselves with it. Right. Yeah, I do. I really enjoy the Instagrammers and YouTubers that will show themselves messing up. And I think, you know, I have a couple of people in mind that have started to do that. And I really appreciate that. And I look up to them for, for that. Yeah. We have some relationships with some absolutely wonderful folks. Um, you know, people that have been on the show, people that we, we kind of sponsor some of our brand ambassadors and that that's a, that's an important thing. You know, we're not going to build a relationship with anyone who isn't authentic. It's an important word for me as we look at social media. Definitely. But this is not the social media conversation hour. This is martial arts radio. And we're going to talk about you and your martial arts journey. And in order to do that, we have to talk about the origin of that journey. So how'd you get started? I got started pretty young. Um, My brother actually dressed up as Chuck Norris for Halloween when we were a kid. And I, he kept the costume and then I wore it around the house all the time. And I just wanted the uniform so bad. So I kept asking my parents to put me in karate, put me in karate, put me in karate. So finally they did when I was about eight. And um, I started out in, it was one of those kind of like mixed styles of martial arts that they called it karate, but it, it wasn't traditional. It was more of like a choi kwando type thing. Mm-hmm. So I learned my basics through that. And it was a lot of flowy stuff. So whereas Taekwondo, you're like sticking every move. This one wasn't that way. So if you try to go to competition with something like this, it would not, not work well, but it was a great base because I learned to like keep my hands up and, you know, I learned stances and this and that, but it actually ended up closing right before I got my black belt. And they knew some people personally who had opened another school, but it was in Taekwondo and they sent us there. So ever since then, which was about 2005, I've been in Taekwondo and that was a rough transition. But to me, it, like looking back on it, I'm really glad it happened because it worked out really well. And Taekwondo is obviously more well known. And then I learned more of the technique side of martial arts with that. So that's in a nutshell how I got started. Okay. When you say that making the transition into Taekwondo was rough, what do you mean? Well, um, what happened was we, they closed, but they allowed us to get our black belts. So anyone who was really close, which I was one belt away. So I earned my black belt at 13, but then pretty much had to start over. So you can imagine a 13 year old, you've been working for your black belt for years and you get it, but then you don't know the forms and you don't know the curriculum because you're starting in a new school. So that was super difficult just like mentally. And I was just upset for the longest amount of time that I was hard headed. I didn't want to learn it because I just wanted to, you know, I wanted to be treated like a black belt. I wanted to know everything. So, um, but then once I finally came around to it, I had to learn all of their forms and everything like that. Um, but actually I, I like those forms better now, but it was hard to learn to stick kicks instead of just flop them out there and and stuff like that so it kind of brought me back to the basics of of deeper stances is what they wanted and um the first martial art was more of a boxing style so in what they would call a front stance you would kind of bend both knees whereas in taekwondo in a front stance like your back leg needs to be locked out Mm -hmm. you know so just kind of stuff that i had had with muscle memory i had to break so that's really hard to do for anybody but especially for a kid you know Sure. Sure. And yeah, anybody that's cross trained or, you know, spent a a decade or two in one style and switched over to something completely different knows how hard that can be to unlearn. I've talked a little bit about my journey starting with karate and 
transitioning into Taekwondo and, and what that was like, because the differences aren't huge. They're subtle. And I, I think sometimes the subtle differences are the harder ones to pick up. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Well, that gives us a great place to start. And as we move forward, I know we're going to hear a lot more about you and your journey and, and all that. But here on Martial Arts Radio, it's about the stories. Anybody that listens knows I love a good story. It's the reason I started this show. So I'd love for you to tell us your favorite martial arts story. That actually kind of brings me back to where I was, which I think my favorite martial arts story would be my black belt test. Because, you know, going up through the solid ranks, your tests are exciting, but they're fairly common. You know, you're doing it every couple of months. And then also even like after black belt, like all of my degrees have been exciting, but nothing really is like your first black belt test, you know. So um, what happened was I said my school was closing and they were trying to get anybody who could test, who was eligible to just go ahead and test. So we were at the new school and my instructors from the old school came in to test us. But the only time they could do it was on a Tuesday night. And we were like, we were all kind of in middle school age. So we were testing on a Tuesday night. And of course, I was so nervous. And we came in and this is actually the last time I got to see all of those old instructors. But they were trying to make us even more nervous. You know, if you fail this test, we're going to cut your brown belt in half and you're never going to get it back, you know, this and that. So we go through the test and there's five of us. And I happen to be the only girl. And at the end of the test, uh, my school goes through where all the black belts kind of talk and tell you how they, what they thought about the test and give you some advice and this and that. And one of my instructors said that uh, he has never seen such a standout in the test. I don't want to sound like I'm bragging or anything because I look back on it and I, I cringe. But uh, he, was, he was like, you know, this goes to show that girls can – can be the standout, can outdo guys in a, in a male dominant sport, you know? And I think to me that kind of struck something in me that I was like, Oh, wow. You know, not that I hadn't already realized it, but I was like, this is a male dominant sport. And because of that, I can either like shy away from it, or I think I could go really far in it because you're going to get more attention if you work just as hard. You know, so I was the only one that broke all my boards on the first try and this and that. And to me, it was just it wasn't that I was much better than them, but I was just so determined at that age to get that black belt. So that one kind of stood out to me um, just because of that and what he said. And to me, that has sparked something for me as to where I went from there. Hmm. If you could go back, excuse me, and you had the opportunity to talk to yourself, say, an hour before that, that event. What would you tell yourself? Hmm, that's a good one. Um, probably just to do your best, you know, calm down. But, you know, you want to say that to yourself before any test or competition, but uh, you're never going to be calm before that. Um but pretty much to enjoy it. You know, I think we go through so many things as martial artists, so many tests or competitions or anything, and you're so focused that you don't actually enjoy the moment and realize what you're doing. You know, not many people get to black belt or or beyond. So instead of just being so stressed out about the test, actually you know, be proud of yourself and enjoy the fact that you got there. Mm. Wonderful, wonderful advice. All too often we, we spend our days looking backwards at, at the good old days or looking forward towards things that haven't arrived. And really, if you, if you want to be really philosophical about it, I think all you have is the moment at hand. Yes, definitely. Is there anything that you're passionate about outside martial arts? Any hobbies? Um, I've recently gotten into a couple different things. I've gotten into running. I actually did a half marathon this past weekend in Disney World. Whoa, And okay. it was my 10th half marathon. 
So I got into that kind of uh, accidentally. I, I'm a huge Disney fan, and I was in Disney World uh, about five years ago, and they were doing what's called Marathon Weekend. Mm -hmm. And I just noticed everybody walking around with medals on. And I'm very, like, goal-oriented. I want those trophies. I want the medals. And I was like, what is this? I want, I want this medal. So I looked it up, and I was like, okay, next year I'm coming back, and I'm doing a half marathon. So I got my brother into it also. And since then, that was four years ago, I've done 10 half marathons and multiple 5Ks. And not to say that I'm good. I've never been great at running. But to me, it's it's that environment. I, I absolutely love it. Everybody's super encouraging. It doesn't matter if you're winning or if you're you know, last place, people are going to encourage you the entire way. So I love that. And then I also recently have gotten into bowling. So my, uh, my fiance is actually, we are both in a bowling league together and he's doing much better than me and, and <laughs> wants to go pro, but, and I'm just nice. over here, you know, excited to like break 150. but, um, it's been fun. You know, I like getting into, into different things. I've never been like, Martial arts has, has stuck with me throughout all of life, but also I've, I've had so many other things going on. Like I've never been able to really focus on, on one thing. Mm. Does that manifest in your martial arts training too? It does. Oh my gosh. And to me, it's a good and bad thing. You know, like part of me wishes I could just have tunnel vision and focus on one thing because that's how you get great at it, you know? But I just, I'm not that person. I'm like, oh, I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to do this. And when it comes to martial arts, there's, there's so many types of martial arts that I'm like, I want to train in this and I want to train in this and I want to train in this. And then I realize I'm like, I don't have the money or time to do all of that. You know, like I need to, I need to focus. So, um, I have been kind of all over the place, which, you know, has gotten me different experiences, but also, um, you know, if I would have stuck with with one specific thing, I could have been, you know, great at that. But, you know, there's pros and cons to both, both of those types. Yeah. As you were talking about running and just the encouragement. Now I, I'm, I can run. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not fond of it. You know, I, I run, you know, when it shows up in a CrossFit workout or, you know, I, I hike, which is kind of slow uphill running, not really walking. <laughs> But the way you're describing the encouragement and, and just kind of the, the vibe around it reminded me a little bit of martial arts and some of the schools that I've attended. Is, do you see a correlation there? I do. I see it in, um, yeah, in smaller schools. I've been to a couple of different schools, and I see it more so in the ones that um, kind of act like family. You know, like you can walk into different schools and kind of realize um, – you know, oh, this is a school that they probably don't even know all of their students' names. Or this is a school that, you know, they probably have a cookout after every test. You know, like there's there's complete differences. And I've been in both. And the ones that that feel like family, they do. Like they will support you through anything. And I think those are, to me, that's where I, I want to be. Awesome. I get it. One of the hallmarks of the show is is kind of unpacking the toolkit that we all develop as martial artists, our ability to live life and have resources that non-martial artists just don't seem to have. I mean, sometimes they gain them, but it's more of a, uh, a commonality that we have as martial artists. And another commonality is going through difficult times. I mean, we, we, all, we all suffer. We all have challenges. I'd love for you to tell us about a time where you went through one of those challenges and how your martial arts helped you get through it. Sure. Um, what comes to mind, and I think this happens to most martial artists, is injury. So I competed a good bit for a couple of years, and I was at one just local competition, and... I was starting to warm up and instead of stretching, I just threw a kick. And that is the point that I realized, okay, I'm 
too old to do this. I have to warm up. I have to stretch because my hamstring just, I don't, I have no idea what happened to it, but it was just like, oh my gosh, I can't walk, you know, and I'm trying to warm up for a competition right now. So I, I struggled through that competition and it, it just so happened that I won my division. So then I went on to grands, which I've never been upset to go on to grands except for that one time. <laughs> Cause I was like, I don't want to do my form again. But, um, I got through that competition and then I was like, I'm just going to rest it. You know, I'm not one to like run off to the doctor right away. So I was like, I'm just going to rest it and, and see how it goes. And it was one of those things that I could rest it for a, a week and be okay. But then after I trained, it would come back. So I didn't want to be told to rest, you know, so I kept putting off going to the doctor and putting off going to the doctor because I was trying, that was my first year doing WKC. And I was like, I want to go to nationals and I want to go to worlds and I don't have time to not train. So I just kept training, kept training, kept training. And when I realized that I really couldn't keep doing that was actually on the flight to Detroit for nationals because just sitting on that flight, which to us is about three and a half to four hours, I, my leg was on fire just sitting on it. And I was like, I can't, I can't get through this. So I ended up finally giving it some time to rest and, and actually doctoring it up and everything. But it took about eight months for me to be able to kick again, like normally without any pain. And I look at it and like, you know, one of the tenets of Taekwondo is perseverance. And I I persevered through that Um, to a certain point. I probably shouldn't have. I probably should have stopped and like let it calm down. But um, it's one of those things that like, I don't, I don't think any martial artist when they come to an injury, they're not, they don't give up right away, you know? And I would say even athletes in general, you know, if, if the typical person who doesn't have the athletic mindset you know, rolls their ankle or whatever. Most of them are like, okay, I'm going to sit down and and let this heal. But most athletes, at least the ones that I talk to and stuff, they're like, oh, you know, I don't want to sit down. Like we don't, we don't sit down. That's why you're so active. You know, like we don't want to let it sit down. We don't want to let it heal and stuff like that. And I think that's just a mindset that comes with athletes or martial artists, like you're go, 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 you know? And like I said before, there's pros and cons to both things, but I don't know. I really, I really like that about it. Um, that I think you, I don't know if I, if I have a, an off day, you know, I don't, I don't like not, I don't, I don't know where I'm going with this. Can we pause this? <laughs> sure. sure. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, let me try to figure out where I'm going with that one. I, I'm hearing you talk about you know, kind of a, a, a reluctance to not do. Yeah. So I'm trying to, I'm like, as I'm realizing this, I'm like, that that's kind of a bad thing. But there's good stuff that we, that, that comes out of it. I don't think it paints you in a poor light if that's what you're concerned about. Yeah. Because again, it's you being authentic talking about, look, you, I mean, you, you're a, you're a fourth down, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, the, the fact that, you know, you've got the physical stuff, You know, you can do the things it's, I mean, all the rest of your, the majority of the rest of your martial arts is going to be around the mental stuff. Right. And it's, this is a challenge that we all deal with regardless of age, rank and experience. Yeah. So I guess the mentality of, of not giving up through hard times would be a good place to go with this. Okay. So you can jump back in whenever, whenever you've right. got a sense as to where, where you want to go with it. And we'll, you know, we'll make sure we edit it in a way that makes sense. Okay. Do you want me to start back over at any certain place or just? Whatever makes the most sense for, for your thought process. Okay. Let me think about it for a second. Okay. I would say for martial artists, the mentality of not giving up or persevering through tough times, whether that be injury or anything else is what I think really sets us out from non-martial artists because 
I tell my students too, I always point out the the black belts and I say, who wants to be a black belt? And of course, all of them raise their hand. That's what they're there for. And I tell them how, you know, how long it takes to get there and what the black belt test is like. And you're not going to get there unless you persevere through some hard times. I mean, no black belt test is easy. It doesn't matter where you go. And an, an average person who hasn't gone through martial arts, who hasn't learned that perseverance is not going to get through something like that. Like I've been asked by family members and friends who aren't martial artists, like, why do you do that? You know, you can buy a black belt. And I'm like, yeah, but that's not the point. You know, I can buy my own trophy. I can buy a black belt. You can buy whatever you want, but it's not going to mean something unless you earn it. And I think as a martial artist, um, I've learned that I want to really earn everything that I get. So. Yeah, right on. I get it. And what you're talking about here, you know, it's it's that that reward for what we invest. You can buy anything, but we see time and again that when people earn things, whether it, you're talking about a a child or an adult, whether it's you know something sort of trivial, you know, uh, from a hobby or work related. We value the things that we have invested more of ourselves into. And to me, that's one of the beauties of martial arts is that we get this really, really simple external representation of that hard work. I mean, there, there are plenty of people who, you know, don't have stripes on their belt. You know, their, their belt, that black belt is the same for quite a long time. But yeah. they continue to invest into it. Yep. Yeah, and it doesn't, you know, once you get up high in rank, you realize it really doesn't have to do with the color of the belt. You know, I'm, I'm least impressed at this point with how many stripes somebody has on a black belt. And I'm more impressed with how worn out their black belt looks, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, like they can have a first degree that's, you know, turning white because they've worn it and trained so much. And maybe they just have been so focused on something else that they haven't tested, you know? Right. So to me, the stripes pretty much mean that, you know, you were consistent in one school and you tested, you know, and it's, it's something to be proud of, but it's also, it doesn't mean everything, you know? One of the best expressions of that I think we've had on the show yet. Thank you. You've had the opportunity to train with some great people. I mean, we haven't talked about anybody by name, but behind every great martial artist is someone who taught them. And I'm assuming there's more than one. But if you had to choose one person that is has been the most influential, the most impactful in your martial arts upbringing, who would that be? I would say that would be the master instructor that I'm I'm learning from now. And... I started with him as a black belt because, as I said earlier, my school closed and then I, I went to his school. So he got me as a 13-year-old a black belt. And for the first probably year, I didn't really stand out to him. You know, I was just another student and that was that. But then something started clicking in my head too. And I, I started training harder, so I think he started noticing and he's one of those people, and I think you'll find this in a lot of martial arts instructors, that the more they like you, the harder they are on you. So <laughs> I started realizing that he was, uh, you know, if, if we had an uneven number in class and somebody had to be his partner, it was me. And he was pushing my partner off and it was me so that I had to do double the kicks and this and that. And as a kid, at first, I wasn't understanding this. I was like, oh, my gosh, why? And then I look back on it and I was like, oh, you know, and I really appreciate that at this point. But not only as a martial artist, but as a person, he he really teaches you how to have the mindset of a martial artist and how to be a martial artist outside of the school. Um, he he's very, very old school. He doesn't go by a planner or you know, anything like that. He goes off the top of his head. And if he gets stuck on one form and one technique, you'll do that for an hour. 
So I've learned definitely perseverance through him. And then also just respect, you know, a, a lot of schools now, I don't think they have as much respect for their instructors. You know, the students will like correct the instructor if they think it's they're wrong. And I don't care if I know 100% that my instructor is wrong. I'm not going to say anything. You know, like there's there's that much just like respect between it. And then as I became an adult and a black belt and started getting to know him as more of a person than an instructor, it's just it's become more and more of as of a mentor. You know, um, he's getting older and can't necessarily show me as great of technique as he once could. But now it's just more of a talking. And, you know, what do you think about this? And what do you think about this? And it's just kind of grown into more of a mentorship than martial arts instructor, you know? So I think he's, he's probably the biggest influence because to me, martial arts is, yes, it's a lot about technique and punching and kicking, but what I love about it is the mentality and the mindset and actually like becoming a martial artist, you know? Mm. Yes. Do you find that you're having similar kind of mentor mentee relationships with some younger students? I would hope so. Uh, right now, I'm teaching little dragons. So they're four to seven. And, you know, I they're not going to understand if I, you know, try to give them life advice at that age. But <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> I really hope that I'm going to be one of those instructors that they look back on and, and remember, you know, but I, I try to give them a little bit of advice. We talk about, you know, goal setting, and I try to teach them a little bit about becoming a martial artist and, you know, make sure you, you know, shake their hand and, and this and this bow to the flags and, and whatever. So just the, the basics at this point, but I would really hope so that somebody would one day look back on, on me that way also. Nice. And I got to ask little dragons, is that a class that you enjoy teaching or is that one that you kind of got? <laughs> leveraged into i find that it's very <laughs> there's no middle ground when it comes to teaching the little ones i actually really love it i love that age not to say that that there aren't bad days you know like they sometimes i'm checking the clock every five minutes like when am i done with this but most of the time they're great and to me it's like it's so fresh you know like they're they're all white belts or yellow belts and I just love that. I love being the first one to teach them and the first one to explain stuff. And I actually kind of am trying to start this program in the school that I'm training in right now. So I, I did ask for it, but and sometimes I regret it, but I, I do really like them. If you can teach it to a four-year-old, you can teach it to anyone. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, most of it is, is, uh, I, I mean, I'm excited if they stand still, you yes. know, so it's, it's a struggle, but it also, I think it keeps you young. Completely agree. Now, if you could train with someone you haven't anywhere in the world, alive, dead, doesn't matter. Who would you want to train with? Jeez. So many people come to mind. Like I said, um, like we talked about before, I'm so interested in so many different martial arts that people come to mind for the sport karate side of it, but people also come to mind for like just training. So if it was like hardcore training, I know right now it's like you either love her or hate her, but I would say Ronda Rousey because no matter, you know, yes, she's lost the last couple of fights and kind of fallen off the face of the earth, but, um, I'm still, I don't know. I'm a huge fan. And so I think, I think that'd be fun. And I've all, I'm also really interested in, in MMA training. I would never, never want to fight it, but the training side of it, I think it'd be fun. But if it came to like, say sport karate and, and competition there, there's so many, but the ones that stick out are, um, you know, like Caitlin Deschel and, and all of all of those Tyler Weaver, you, you know, the whole Paul Mitchell team is amazing. So all of those kind of stick out for that side of, of martial arts also. Mm. 
You know, it's funny because we used to talk about Ronda Rousey on the show a fair amount. And obviously this is a traditional martial arts show. We don't really get into MMA. But I think now that it's been a little while since she fought, we start to see the legacy that she's leaving. And I think it's an important one, even for those of us in traditional martial arts, in that we saw for maybe the first time ever a woman in a professional sport being the largest draw. Yes. Any card that she was in, she was the draw. And I thought that was so wonderful and so amazing. And it proves, you know, all the people that have, have said anything counter to that being possible. Well, here's a perfect example of it. And even now, you know, the the folks that she fought and lost to. I mean, even even later, Misha Tate became a bigger draw because of her tie to Ronda Rousey. And, and we see that women's MMA is is kind of a big deal. Yeah. And I think no matter where Ronda Rousey goes from here, whether she ever fights again or what, she's always going to be the one who put women's MMA on the map. You know, if it wasn't for her, I don't know that it would have ever gotten into the UFC or ever done that. Like maybe somebody else would have come along, but she was the one who, who really did it. Yeah. And let's not forget, she's got quite the solid traditional background. Yes. Judo. So I'm just, you know, we we can still claim her a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Let's talk about competition. We've heard a bit about competition, and, and I know that you're passionate about competing. But I'd like to know why. What is it about getting out there? Because let's, let's, let's take a step back. Let's break it down. Competing. You give up your free time. You travel around. You pay money. And at the end, you either win and you know maybe you receive an award you know a medal or a trophy that cost far less than your entrance fee Mm -hmm. or you lose and you feel badly about yourself obviously there's more to it than that because no one would do it if that's all it was but there are people that look at it that way so what are the missing pieces for you what makes it so compelling to me i i grew up in a non- competitive school. I had never heard of competition before. And when I was about 12 or 13, I was on the internet just like searching up martial arts stuff because I was such a a nerd. Like I was just always Googling martial arts stuff. And um, I ran across the Battle of Atlanta, which is, you know, about 20 minutes away from me. So I was like, oh my gosh, I want to do this. I had no idea what it was. So I showed it to my parents and they were like, let's go watch it. And I was like, okay. So at that time I was, I was a brown belt and I went to go watch it and was absolutely amazed. I was like, first of all, I'm glad I didn't enter this because (laughs) it would have been so scary, but, (laughs) but I just, I couldn't get enough of it. I was amazed. So then I was on YouTube and I was watching it all the time and then, but I was so scared to do it because I didn't have somebody to train me to do competition. And I went to my instructors and I was like, Oh, I went to the battle of Atlanta and I saw the competition. Um, and I want to do that. And they were like, okay, cool. Good luck. And like, that was it because they didn't know how to compete. And so they couldn't really tell me. And I was like, I can't do this by myself. You know, like that was intense. So for the next, I don't know, like six, seven years, I pretty much just watched it on YouTube and I went to the Battle of Atlanta every time it came, but I just watched it until finally I was like, you know what? I'm going to regret it if I don't ever try this. So at that point, I was like, you know what? I know a traditional form so I can enter a traditional division. So I found a local competition around Georgia and entered it. And it just so happened that I was the only person in the division. So I was excited that I came away with the trophy, but I was also like, well, that didn't do anything for me, you know, like at least I got, I got out there, but I, I really didn't compete, you know? So then I tried it again and again until eventually there were people in my division and it was every time I went, I was the last one. So like if there were three in my division, I'd get third place. Or if there was seven, I would get seventh place. Like I was just the last one for a couple of years. And I was like, man, what am I doing wrong? You know? 
And I realized that in sport karate, you can't just head out there and, and do your traditional form the way you train it in school, in your school. So I started really, really breaking it down. And I would spend hours just breaking down my form section by section by section. And that was the year that I first did WKC. And I actually, that was, I think, 2015. I went to Ireland and I won Korean forms. And I was like, okay, I can do this now. So then I actually started working for another school around here. And I had left my school that I was training at at the time um, to go work as an instructor. And somebody was there who had competed in ATA. And he was like, I can help you out. And at that point, I, I figured I've probably gotten as far as I can go by myself. So I trained with him and kept like my technique kept getting better and better and better. But things just kept getting in the way that I couldn't consistently train. So I went to WKC again that year. Um, and it was in Orlando. And the thing that got in the way was I did the Disney College program, which is an internship in, in Disney World. And I was there for four months, but I happened to be working in Disney World the same time that WKC was in Orlando. So I was like, oh, I can do this. Like I'd already qualified, but I was training in like a random park in Orlando by myself with like a bow staff in the middle of a soccer field, you know, trying to get ready for it. So that year I went to WKC and I got third, which I was actually pretty excited for, for the circumstances. Um, but that was pretty much my competition career. The next year I tried NBL and it was something, something about it. I just wasn't a humongous fan of, and I, I can't pinpoint it, but it just wasn't for me. Uh, but I did, I, you know, I, I made some friends and, you know, I had a good time. I definitely learned some stuff, but I don't know when it comes to competition for me, all of that to say, um, you know, you can't do it for the trophy. If you're trying to do it for the trophy, eventually you're going to realize that they're just dust collectors. And that's not, that's not what it was for. It was for the experiences and the people that you meet. Like some of my best friends in martial arts I've met through competition mm. and they're so inspiring to me and I just love the meeting but also the the training side of it that's when I started getting so much better in martial arts because I was training for something those couple of years that I was getting in last place every single time I had that determination that I was like I'm I'm not going to end like this you know like I wanted to compete so bad but I didn't want to just go out there and compete. I wanted to win. So I had the determination to figure out what can I do with my form? What do I need to do with my technique to get the little tiny things like, um, you know, kicking with the blade of your foot and, you know, making sure your kick faces the judges and making sure your knee is always locked out in your, you know, uh, stance and this and that to where looking back on it now had I not competed, I don't think I would have the technique that I had now because I would have no reason to do it. So I think to me, it gives you something to work for. And some people, it's not, it's not for them. It won't push them to work. Like they'll just be like, Oh, I don't like this and, and be over it. Like it's definitely not for everybody. But to me, it was what I needed to push myself to be able to, to become a better martial artist the sort of cliche, the saying that comes to mind is if you look around the room and you're the best person in the room, you need a bigger room. Yes, definitely. And for me, and it sounds like for you and many others that I know, some who've been on the show, that's what competition has done, has extended the size of the room because, you know, human beings tend to rise to the occasion. You know, not, not mm -hmm. all. I mean, you, you certainly express that and no competition isn't for everyone but to find a way to be around people better than you so you can continue to absorb and learn and watch what they do it's so important yeah and to see people who are so determined and driven i think that's what you need and in life in general you know i mean look around at your friends and they 
really determine kind of the person that you are too. Like if you're hanging out with friends who aren't determined and driven to do anything, then it's going to be hard for you to be also. So I think, you know, putting yourself in competition, you find those people because they're not going to be there unless they're, they're determined to work hard. Exactly. Do you watch martial arts movies? Yes, I do. Do you have any favorites? Um, the karate kid. <laughs> Which the one? Original. Which one? Okay. The original, the original one. All right. <laughs> Not the Kung Fu kid. But... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that is, uh, as soon as I got into martial arts, my dad rented that movie from Blockbuster on VHS and he was like, you have to watch this. So I watched it and I was obsessed and I watched that and Karate Kid 2, the Karate Kid 3, the next Karate Kid, you know, all of them. And then I was super excited when the new Karate Kid came out fairly recently. And I was like, oh, I want to go watch this. And I mean, as a martial artist, I, I loved that martial arts was on the big screen. But I was like, this is Kung Fu. Like, what are you doing? But I don't know. I think it was a great standalone movie. But the original Karate Kid still still has it an exceptional movie yeah you know yeah yeah it's 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 not great in any way like it the acting's no. <laughs> not great the martial arts isn't great the story is not great the music is absolutely not great <laughs> but it's somehow yep. a great movie it's one of those rare movies that became greater than the sum of the parts and and you talk to any martial arts instructor who was teaching back then and they can tell you the impact of that movie yeah, I I absolutely loved it and still can watch it to this day. Probably like I can watch it all the time and it, it just never gets old. I don't know. How about martial it's, arts? Are? Oh, go ahead. I, don't know, I was just going to talk about how cheesy it was, but go ahead. <laughs> we can talk about that all day. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it's a popular topic. How about martial arts actors? Um, I don't have any that really stand out. I mean, obviously Jackie Chan is huge and I, I love watching his movies because on top of his exceptional martial arts, he's hilarious, you know? So all of his martial arts movies have great fight scenes, but also make you laugh, you know? So I really like that. But on top of that, I, I can't really pinpoint any specific person. Hmm. He's one of my favorites. For sure. Yeah. How about books? Sometimes on the show we talk about martial arts books and it, it people either tend to have a whole library of martial arts related books and they love them or none. <laughs> I have Where are you? some. Okay. All right, so some. you're in the middle. Yes. Um I my favorite martial arts book is Zen in the Martial Arts. Mm. And I like it for multiple reasons. It was just very interesting. But also, it's one of those ones you can just sit down and read the whole thing in one sitting. Yes. Um, it's just, it's got a lot of great stories in it and a lot of good takeaways. But it's not, you know, 700 pages and makes you fall asleep. So I appreciate that. And then on t over that, I also have, I'm actually looking at my library right now. I have um, the book that was written by the Lopez family, and it's called Family Power, mm. and it's their story. I mean, it's kind of older, but I really like that because I like reading about people's lives. Um, and then I have one kind of funny one, and it is like a little picture book, and it's called The Wind Warrior. Have you ever heard of it? No, no. Tell us about it. Okay, so when I was a kid, I used to go to the library a lot, and I would always check out this book, and it's called The Wind Warrior, and it's a children's book, and it's about training for a competition. And it, this was when I was so interested in competition, but I was too scared to do it. So it's this boy who's training for a competition, and this whole book, and then he goes to the competition and, and wins it. And it's a true story, I think. Um, somebody wrote it about him, but for some reason, I just always checked it out of the library and always read it. 
And then as an adult, I was at like a, a book sale one time and it was there. And I was like, I have to buy this. Like this just, this is my childhood at this point. You know, I have to buy this. So I still have it and still every now and then just sit down and read it. But that's just kind of a funny one off to the side, but. Nice. Yeah. As you're talking about buy, buying a book as an adult that you read as a kid, it just reminded me, I have several books in my library that I probably checked out, you know, 20, 30 times as a kid. And then later on when the library sold them off, my mother bought them and sent them to yeah. me. Yeah. Like, yep. I read this book. <laughs> Not martial arts related. We didn't have anything fun like that in the library. <laughs> now, of course, we mentioned at the beginning, you're on social media. You know, people might want to check out what you're doing, get a hold of you. You know, I'm sure some of the folks listening have been to the same events that you've been at, and they might want to say, oh, Master Croft, I'm going to say hi or something. You know, if, if people want to get a hold of you, if they want to find you online, where do they do that? Sure. I have a Instagram and it's Jalen, J-A-L-Y-N underscore kicks. And I, my goal actually this year is to try to post one picture a day. So that's actually, I'm realizing harder than it seems. And we're only eight days into the year, (laughs) but, (laughs) but I post on it fairly, fairly often. And I, and then I also have a YouTube channel And it's just my full name, Jalen Croft. And I'm posting on it fairly often, like I said. Um, It's probably like one video a week. I'm trying to, but I I definitely don't want to like specifically say that. But I do a lot of training videos, just kind of set up the camera while I'm training. And then I'm starting to get into some tutorials. And I actually really enjoy that. I started seeing some martial artists on YouTube and I was like, oh, I want to try that. And I actually realized that I really enjoy editing and everything. So so that's kind of something that I'm focusing on this year, social media in general. Nice. You might want to check out, um, if, if you're having trouble managing the postings, you might want to check out something like Buffer. I believe the website's bufferapp.com. You could load in a bunch of photos at ahead of time. Oh, nice. And then it'll just kind of meter them out for you. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. For any of you out there listening that think that whenever a whistle kick photo gets posted, it's because I'm at the computer. No. (laughs) (laughs) Because there is way too much going on for me to, to, oh, it's 1230. I got to put out a photo. (laughs) It does not work that way. Definitely. I'm realizing that social media can become a job in itself. It is a job in itself. Especially, well, if you're doing it right anyway. Yes. Do you have any goals for the future? Like if you look out five, ten, whatever years, what do you want to, what do you want to be doing? I would say I want to be teaching. Um, I don't know exactly where, you know, uh, the school that I'm at right now is, is great because uh, I'm back to the school that I, I grew up in. So they kind of know me, I know them, they let me try what I want to try. And um, so that's fun. But I want to kind of branch out of of just the little dragons and also get to talk to an adult every now and then. So (laughs) (laughs) I I definitely want to be teaching. Um, I I mean, I, I just got my fourth degree, not even a month ago. So I'm not necessarily thinking about my fifth yet. Cause that's a really, really long way off. Um, so pretty much, I guess my, my goals right now and, and what I'm looking at is becoming a, a better instructor because I think that's something that's looked over. A lot of people think that once they're a black belt, they can instruct. And I've realized that's not necessarily it. Like that's a whole different learning process in itself you know, to learn how to get what you've learned and get what's in your mind to actually come out and get somebody else to understand it and to also let them have fun at the same time and get motivated and this and that and realizing that different people respond to different things, you know, so you have to kind of get to know every one of your students and realize 
what you have to say to them to make them do what you want them to do and stuff like that. And that's just, it's something that's an ongoing journey. And, um, my instructor told me when I got my fourth degree, he was like, at this point, it's really what you give back to martial arts that matters. Like you're at the point that you've trained, you've done what you need to do and obviously continue to train, but you really need to start focusing on giving back and all of that knowledge that you've been given. Now you need to give it to somebody else in return. So I think that's really my focus for the next couple of years is, is how to do that in the best way possible. And like we said earlier, try to become that instructor that maybe one day somebody will look back on and say, Oh yeah, like she was, she was my inspiration and she's, you know, the biggest part of my journey. Everything today has been great. I really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing with us and being so honest and open. But if I could trouble you for one more thing, if you could send us out with just the best advice you've ever given anyone, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> I know, right? But, but truly, you know, some, some final words for the folks listening would be great. Sure. Um, as any martial artist, I would say just don't never give up. I mean, like I, I've talked about perseverance before, and that's the one that I always go back to because out of the tenets of Taekwondo, that one is my absolute favorite. And with martial arts, with your journey, and I call it a journey because it's, it's so long, it's never ending. There are going to be so many times that you want to quit on yourself and you want to go find something else to do or something gets in the way. But just... I would say never give up on what you're trying to do and never forget why you started. You know, like everybody starts martial arts for a reason and everybody's reasoning is different, but you need to keep that reason in mind the whole way. And a lot of the times you're going to get distracted, but you need to come back to that. And my favorite saying is that a black belt is just a white belt that never gave up. And I think that's, that's, one of the best things that just is I think any black belt will completely agree with that. Everybody is a white belt on the inside. And I went back to how, um, how each black belt wears out. And my third degree is actually the first belt that ever wore down to the white. And I made an Instagram post about it when it wore down to it and said, this goes to show that there is a white belt underneath every single black belt and you never get to stop training it doesn't matter how how many stripes are on your belt how many black belts you have you never get to stop training and never stop training like a white belt never stop training like your basics you're never going to have the absolute perfect sidekick there's always going to be something that you can change and something you can make better so never never get an ego never think that you're the best always know that there is something else to to work for. There's never an end to the martial arts journey. It was during the conversation with Master Croft that I realized that it really was me watching her for the last few years over social media that led to our conversation. This is the first time that I've watched a guest from afar before inviting them on the show. I've personally seen her growth and her progress the last few years, and she's inspired me. Hopefully, she's also inspired you. Thank you, Master Croft, for coming on the show. If you want the show notes, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Photos, links, social media. Sometimes we drop in video. All in all, it is a great behind-the-scenes supplement to what we do in audio here on the show twice a week. You should check it out. If you want to get a hold of us, you can find us on social media. Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram are our primary accounts. We are at Whistlekick. You can leave comments on the show notes page at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. And we don't talk about it often. It's not a secret, but we don't push it. We have a private Facebook group just for listeners of the show. Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, behind the scenes. As you can see, I am not creative when I name things. We just kind of tell you what it is in the title. Make it simple. I want to thank you for stopping by, listening to my voice, giving me 
a bit of purpose in my life, honestly. That's all I've got for now. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>